The moon is a mathematical impossibility? An observational error, says an astrophysicist? Impossible metals and clouds on the moon? That and much more coming up in today's episode about our favorite satellite, the moon. You see the moon almost every night, and you probably had thoughts in the back of your mind how unique the moon is. But have you really thought it through? In this episode, we're going to show you why the moon is not only unique, but a mathematical impossibility. The moon is so perfect, its placement so exact, and so mind-boggling that it would be easier to explain why it shouldn't be there than why it should. <laughs> so after this episode, you'll be asking yourself, what in the world could the moon really be, and why no one is really digging into these coincidences? Rob and I have our own ideas, but we'll let you judge this one for yourself. The moon and time. Okay, basic facts about the moon. So the moon's average distance from the Earth is 2,500, miles. Why is this important? Because every planet, including Pluto, fits exactly between the Earth and the moon. The moon's distance varies, but at some moments, it's exactly the entire solar system. Did you know we have 178 satellite moons in our solar system? There is no other example of any satellite-planet relationship like this that exists in the entire solar system. That in and of itself is a mathematical anomaly. It's so strange and so exact that you have to decide whether this is coincidence or intelligent design. By the way, some of you smart fans out there may be asking why we're saying the solar system has 178 moon satellites when it actually only has 173. Well, that's because Ben and I are a little old-fashioned, and we count Pluto as a planet. Take, Take that, that, NASA. NASA. <laughs> if you really want to know why we count Pluto as a planet, we can do a video just on that. Here's a quote from Erwin Shapiro, Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. The best possible explanation for the moon is observational error. The moon doesn't exist. The moon is bigger than it should be, apparently older than it should be, and much lighter in mass than it should be. It occupies an unlikely orbit, and it is so extraordinary that all existing explanations for its presence are fraught with difficulties. Okay, next, the strange phenomena of 108. The sun is 108 Earths wide. 108 suns fit between the Earth and the sun, and 108 moons fit between the Earth and the moon. Now think about the fact that those planets all fit in there perfectly. There is so much going on here at the same time that my melon's about to explode. What is the significance of 108? Well, let's see what cultures and history say about it. During his passion, Jesus received a total of 6,666 blows, 108 of which were to his stomach. Soon after the birth of the Buddha, 108 Brahmins were invited to the name-giving ceremony. There are 108 paths to godhood that exist in some traditions of the East. There are 108 lords of the Tao, according to Taoism. 108 earthly desires, lies, and delusions in Buddhism. Did you know many kung fu forms have exactly 108 movements? Buddhism and Brahmin necklaces also have 108 beads. The epistle of St. James in Christianity, whose central message is that there is no authentic faith without charitable works, contains on the whole 108 verses. Yeah, that's interesting. 108 sacred books and the holy writings of Tibet. The list goes on and on. Are all of these coincidences? How much do humans really know? The moon is a bell. This is actually my favorite one. During the Apollo 12 mission to the moon, they set up seismometers. Afterwards, they intentionally crashed their lunar module. This created an impact equal to that of one ton of TNT. It's like something like 1,006 of dynamite, some crazy thing like that. Right, yeah. The shock waves built up for eight minutes, and NASA scientists said the moon, quote, rang like a bell. <laughs> Maurice Ewing, American geophysicist and oceanographer, had this to say. As for the meaning of it, I'd rather not make an interpretation right now, but it is as though someone had struck a bell, say in the belfry of a church, a single blow and found that the reverberation from it continued for 30 minutes. So Ken Johnson, supervisor of the data and photo control department during the Apollo missions had this to say. The moon not only rang like a bell, but the whole moon wobbled in such a precise way that it was almost as though it had gigantic hydraulic damper struts inside it. You know, so this indicates that not only is the moon hollow, but that its layers consist of hard metal. So these experiments have led many people to believe that the moon is actually a purposeful creation placed there by an insanely advanced civilization. Eclipses are a freak of nature, or right. not nature at all. 
Do you know how amazing a total eclipse is? The fact that the moon seems to be the exact size as the sun at that distance is a mathematical impossibility unless you calculate some kind of intelligent design into the equation. The prestigious scientist Isaac Asimov once said, according to all the data available, the moon in principle should not exist in that position. He also said the moon is big enough to result in a solar eclipse, yet small enough to generate a corona. Our astronomy just can't explain the coincidences among the coincidences. So why is this possible? The sun is 400 times bigger than the moon, but the sun is also about 400 times further away. Let's go over some interesting data. For the most part, the moon shines on the earth at night and the sun shines on the earth during the day. There isn't another example of this in our entire solar system. Well, eclipses have to do with orbit. Let's hear what William R. Sheldon, a scientist, said. In order to orbit around the Earth, a spaceship has to maintain a velocity of 10,800 miles per hour at a height of 100 miles. Similarly, in order for the moon to keep itself in its orbit to balance the Earth's gravitational force, it also needs accurate velocity, self-weight, and altitude. Basically, what Sheldon is getting at is that this is extremely <laughs> unlikely. The moon to Earth size ratio is extremely unlikely. You know what else is extremely unlikely? Have you ever thought how big the moon is? The moon is unnaturally large for a satellite. In fact, it is too large in comparison to its parent planet. Mars being the smaller example has two moons. Its largest satellite is about 0.34% that of Mars. Between Jupiter and Saturn's many satellites, neither of them have a moon that is more than 3.75% that of the actual planet. So get this everyone, the Earth's moon is 27% that the size of our planet. None of the satellites in our solar system has a diameter exceeding 5% of the parent planet's diameter. So to conclude, how did we get so lucky to have a moon 27% that the size of Earth's when this example doesn't exist anywhere else in the solar system by a huge margin. Yeah. Christopher Knight and Alan Butler, who wrote the book, Who Built the Moon, had this to say. The moon has astonishing synchronicity, with the sun both set at the same point on the horizon at the equinoxes and at the opposite point at the solstices. What are the chances that the moon would naturally find an orbit so perfect that it would cover the sun at an eclipse and peer from Earth to be the same size? What are the chances that the alignments would be so perfect at the equinoxes and solstices? The moon's craters are way too small. So according to scientific calculations, if a meteorite of several miles in diameter hits the Earth or the moon at a speed of 30,000 miles per second, which is equivalent to 1 million tons of dynamite, the depth of the crater it creates should be four or five times that of its diameter. The meteorite craters on Earth prove this to be correct, yet the craters on the moon are strangely shallow. For example, the Gargan Crater, the deepest one, is only four miles deep, although its diameter is 186 miles. With a diameter of 186 miles, get this, the depth of the crater should be at least 700 miles. Instead of four miles, which is just 12% of the diameter, another scientific impossibility. Hmm. Impossible metals are found on the moon. So moon craters have a great deal of lava. What's strange is that the lava contains rich metal elements such as titanium, chromium, and yttrium, which is rarely found on Earth. Helium-3 is also found on the moon, which is an isotope that could provide safer nuclear energy and is not at all radioactive. What does this mean? Well, it wouldn't produce any wonky waste that we do here on Earth. And why aren't they mining this? Ugh. I saw some reports that the cost it would take to mine would completely pay for itself. That's how valuable helium-3 is. Right. So those metals we discussed are extremely hard and resistant to both high temperatures and corrosion. Scientists estimate that it would require 2,000 to 3,000 degrees Celsius to melt these metals. But the moon has been dead and cold without volcanic activity for at least 3 billion years. So how in the world did the moon generate so many kinds of metals that require such high temperatures to melt? Moreover, analysis of the 380 kilograms of moon soil samples brought back by the astronaut shows that there is pure iron and pure titanium. Such pure metal deposits aren't, just aren't found under natural conditions, concluding these metal elements were not formed under natural conditions, but were extracted. And the question is, by who? Or and by, when? Yeah, exactly. So Dr. Harold Urey, Nobel Prize winner for chemistry, had this to say. 
I'm terribly puzzled by the rocks from the moon, and in particular of their titanium content. Dr. S. Ross Taylor, geochemist of lunar chemical analysis, had this to say. The problem was that the Maria Plains, those are the dark areas of the moon, the size of Texas, had to be covered with melted rock containing fluid titanium. He said you would not expect titanium to ever be hot enough to do that, even on Earth, and no one has ever suggested that the moon was hotter than the Earth. Right. What could distribute titanium in this way? Highly advanced technology developed and operated by entities that are immensely more technologically advanced than humans. The moon actually has clouds. The famous scientist Cassini discovered a cluster of clouds over the moon in 1671. In April 1786, William Herser, the father of modern astronomy, observed the signs of volcanic eruptions on the moon. Although, like I just said, scientists believe there hasn't been any volcanic activity on the moon for three billion years. Then what was observed that looked like volcanic eruptions? Clouds. Here's an interesting fact, you guys. In 2002, retired astronaut Buzz Aldrin punched a conspiracy theorist in the face after he was accused of never having gone to the moon. So I want to raise this question. Why would Buzz punch someone in the face unless he was really emotionally charged by that, right? Mm -hmm. Perhaps something insane or traumatic actually happened on the moon. If you want to hear what really happened on the moon and how Stanley Kubrick was involved with the moon video and why, you'll have to comment below and let us know you're interested. We got all of the info, people. <laughs> So what do you guys think about all these facts and figures about the moon? Do you still think it's a natural occurrence? Or was it made and put there for a reason? And if so, by who? Or by what? Let us know what you think below. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe for more videos and let us know what you want us to talk about. Until then, we'll see you guys out on the edge of the dark side of the moon. Hey guys, hope you're enjoying this episode. If you want to watch the rest and get access to our full catalog of content with hundreds of videos that will keep you entertained for hours and hours, subscribe to Rise.tv. Also, don't forget to hit like and subscribe so you don't miss a single new drop. Yeah, and we'll see you out on, on the, the Edge. edge.